get started with uh, Mr. Galloway's presentation. We have several special guests we'd like to welcome in the audience. Uh, first of all, we have Bill and Jenny Beck sitting here in the front row. Uh, Bill Beck is a veteran of the Battle of LZ X-ray, and he is also one of the key architects for a new Vietnam exhibit, which will open on the Army Heritage Trail tomorrow. In the back, we also have Mr. Bob Daniel. Uh, we have somewhere one of the Army's newest second lieutenant, second lieutenant John Ferry, and also uh, Mr. Galloway's assistant, Michelle Ball, up here in front. Uh, please welcome all of our distinguished guests. Thank you. Thank you for this turnout. I'm uh, honored to be here. I think this is the second time I've spoken for this audience. Maybe not you, but this group, this organization, it's a real pleasure. Always a pleasure to come to Carlisle. Been here many times. It always takes me a little time to catch my breath after that one. You know, we. Uh, we were in Washington last week, and uh, there was a lot of election hullabaloo, so maybe you might have missed a couple of stories that uh, happened up there, but I'll tell you about them. Uh, there was this uh, tall, silver-haired gentleman in about a $6,000 Italian suit after dark walking around Capitol Hill. and. Uh, fellow jumped out of the alley and stuck a pistol in his ribs and says, give me your money. The guy got all indignant, drew himself up. He said, you can't do this to me. I'm a congressman. The robber said, okay, in that case, give me my money. <laughs> and the other story, uh, quite unusual is that the, uh, I'm not used to this Britney Spears rig on my ear, <laughs> and uh, I can't dance like her either. They had a uh, unanimous Supreme Court decision, nine to nothing. You know, that's very rare these days. And they ruled that Washington, D.C. would not be allowed to have a nativity scene this year. Not that it was a matter of separation of church and state, it was that they could not find three wise men or a virgin in that town. <laughs> they, they didn't find enough asses to fill every stable in the country. <laughs> I 
I lived in Washington, D.C. for 22 years, and I retired June 1, 2006, from daily journalism anyway, and I loaded up a U-Haul truck and a car trailer and pulled out of there at dawn on June 2nd, 2006, headed south. And uh, I live happily in uh, deepest of South Texas. Nobody knows what a snow shovel looks like down there. Uh, I guess you could say that with, we were soldiers once and young, and the movie, we told the story of X-Ray rather thoroughly. Ten years of research and writing, and uh, you would be right, but we didn't see it as being over and done. And so, three years ago, nearly four, General Moore and I decided we would write a sequel of sorts. We are soldiers still. And we did this in a sense to close the loop, if you would, to write an end to a war. 43 years since our battle, 33 years since the whole thing went down, and we lost a war. And still, it occupies our minds. I, and I, we found that puzzling, although I guess it isn't. Seven years after the end of World War II, we signed peace treaties with Japan and Germany, which we had in the interim rebuilt into competitors and allies, and uh, forgave them, I suppose, uh, the 60 million people that they killed. Uh, but 33 years after Vietnam fell, we still <laughs> bore grudges against Vietnam. And I think that's because we didn't win that war. If they had had the good sense to lose to us, we would have rebuilt their country and uh, made them our allies. So it seemed to us it was time to write an end to a war. And in the process, you know, we went to Vietnam twice, pursuing the interviews with the enemy commanders that we had fought against to try to make our first book a, a circle, a perfect circle if we could, so that you could see it in their eyes as well as ours. And to some extent, we succeeded. Uh, we, it wasn't easy, but we finally persuaded them of our bona fides and, and got General An, General Mon, General Jap, General Huang Fung, the historian, all to sit for hours and hours of taped interviews. And uh, we got to play that fascinating game. Why did you do that? Why didn't you do this? Did you know that our whole rear was wide open the whole first day of the battle? If you'd come at us from that direction, you'd have toppled us right over. And uh, fascinating. We had not been able to do that with anyone since we had the German generals in our prison camps after the war, and it wasn't exactly voluntary on their part. Uh, but they. They went along with it. And all along, we were trying to fulfill a dream of General Moore's. When we first sat down in 1982 to discuss the research of this book, the first book, we uh, asked each other, 
What do you want to see in this book that, that's different, that you don't see in your normal military history? He said, you go first, Joe. I said, well, I want a chapter in there about the families, the wives, the children, brothers, sisters, who lost someone in a battle half a world away and what one bullet and one death did to their lives. And the general nodded. He said, I agree. You've got to do the research and writing on that I can't bear to. And I nodded. And I did. We got that in the book. It's a chapter called The Secretary of the Army Regrets. I wrote it. I can't bear to read it myself to this day. I said, what do you want, sir? He said, oh, he said, I want to go back to the battlefield. I want to go there. I want to spend the night. And I, I was amazed. I said, sir, this is 1982. I, I don't think they would let us in, especially you. And I don't think there's a hope in hell they would let us spend the night on that battlefield. It's five, six clicks from the Cambodian border. They're having trouble with the Khmer Rouge now, their former allies, who are raiding into Vietnam in that particular area. And I just said, I don't think that's possible. And he looked at me with a look that I later came to know meant hide and watch, Joe. So as we pursued these trips back, we pressed the North Vietnamese for his dream to come true. And uh, they were adamant, not going to happen. And we even, on the second trip, said, well, what if we just hire a car and set off south from Hanoi and we go? And our minder from the foreign ministry or one of those ministries said, nice man. He, said, he gave us some good advice. He said, if you do that, when you pull out of Hanoi, there'll be three or four cars full of some very nasty individuals following you. And once you leave the city limits of Hanoi, you're basically, your ass is theirs. And uh, we can't do anything for you. So discretion is the better part of valor, and we decided not to try it. We published the book, and uh, we came to know that they had translated it into Vietnamese, and they had read it and reread it. And they thought that we had treated them fairly and dealt with them honestly, quoted them accurately. And so when ABC TV said we would like to take a party of the Idrang veterans back to Vietnam and back to the battlefield, we said, let's do it. And Hanoi said, yes. They signed off on it. So we set forth a dozen American veterans, myself, General Moore, Bill Beck made the trip, some other good guys from the battle. And we were on our, just about to get on the plane when we got a cable from Hanoi saying, is there anything else you want? And following one of Hal Moore's dictums, always make the other guy say no, we fired back a cable and said, we'd like to meet General Jop at the military museum where they have this huge sand table uh, representation of the battlefield at Dien Bien Phu and, and have him brief us on that battle. And we got on the plane and in about 26 hours or so, I guess, we landed in Hanoi and uh, got off the plane and they s were rushing us through customs and all of the formalities in about two minutes. They said, your plane's late. 
General Jop has been waiting for you a half hour at the museum. So we, we were down there and uh, he shook hands with all the guys in our party and then we went back to the sand table and he talked about this battle. He, he had told us before that he didn't understand why we Americans had come halfway around the world to get involved in their civil war. When if we had just studied what happened to the French there, uh, surely we wouldn't have done that. Surely we would have understood something about the Vietnamese and their determination. And uh, he said, I don't, you know, he said, you paid the tuition. You were paying 65, 70% of the cost of France's war against us by the end of it. If only you had paid the tuition, why didn't you learn the lessons? And on one of our earlier trips, we were given a little advice to you know, you, you have a lot of downtime, a lot of drinking tea and listening to polite chit-chat while waiting for something to happen. And one of these guys told us, you ought to go over to the Museum of Natural History and take a look at our timeline of Vietnam's history. And we did that, General and I. And it's about... 40 yards long on the wall, floor to ceiling. A representation not only of a timeline but of a map. And what you see is about 12, 1500 years of Vietnam's history in that timeline. And you see this big red arrow come down from China. And they take Vietnam and they occupy it. And one time for 600 years, but they were thrown out. You see the arrow recede. And then a century or two passes, and here they come again. And again, after a long occupation, no doubt bloody, they're thrown out. Six times China took Vietnam. Six times they choked on it. And you get down toward the end, and here is about this much of the timeline that represents France's century of colonial occupation. And then you get down to what the Vietnamese call the American War, a matter of a few inches in the scope of things. They call it, interestingly, they explain to us we kept talking about the Vietnam War, and the guide laughed, and he said, you know, they're all Vietnam Wars to us, but we have to differentiate. <laughs> so yours is the American War. And uh, we, we thought a little bit on that timeline, and it certainly put a lot of things in perspective, that, that we, uh, we really concluded that it, it's so easy to start a war, it's so hard to end one. You really ought to go in very cold, not in hot blood and anger, but thoughtful. Go in having studied your enemy and his history, because without that knowledge, you're fighting blind and you're fighting on his turf. And none of us as kids would have done that in the schoolboy wars. You didn't go into somebody else's block in the city, not unless you knew how well they fought. They'd kick your butt. Uh, so we, we had sort of gotten an interesting perspective on some of this, and now, we're about to make our trip back to the battlefield. General Wen Huan, Hal Moore's opposite number as a lieutenant colonel, the battlefield commander against us, 
the man who did his best to kill us all, was coming with us. And two of his colonels, who had been lieutenants, one a company commander, one a political officer in one of the, one of the regiments, were accompanying us. And we rode these little mini buses after we, we flew down from Hanoi to Da Nang and then went south on Route 1, sort of seeing a lot of familiar and unfamiliar territory, and passing by what used to be Chu Lai Marine Base, now gone back to sand dunes, seeing in the distance uh, a monument that rises above the palm trees down in that sandy coastal country with the prickly pears and cactus, very poor soil, the My Lai Massacre Memorial. You can see that from Route 1. Uh, and seeing the changes, Vietnam, 70% of the population today has been born since our war ended. It's ancient history to them. And interestingly, and I ask about this because I've always been a little shocked that the war of my youth occupies four or five paragraphs in your standard American history text in high school here. Guess what? That's about what it occupies in the standard high school history text in Vietnam, too. Uh, it's ancient history and almost forgotten by the Vietnamese. They, they, it's over their shoulder. They, they don't hold grudges. Uh, maybe that's the magnanimity of a victor, and ours is the anger of a, someone who's been defeated. Uh, we, we rode those buses with the enemy commanders. And we discovered some things. We discovered that men who wear the uniform, professional military men, have more in common with each other, no matter what flag they fought under, than they have with any civilian of either of their countries. Uh, and General Moore and General Ahn sort of talking, comparing the their careers from lieutenant to lieutenant general, almost in tandem, and meeting in the middle as lieutenant colonels in this incredible battle, pitting two of the finest light infantry forces in the world head to head, and two of the finest battlefield commanders I've ever seen, Hal Moore and General Ahn. Uh, they became friends. My seatmate was a tall Vietnamese colonel, Colonel Took. And uh, he and I talked. One day, he called the translator over and he tapped me on the chest. He said, you have the heart of a soldier. It's the same heart as beats in my chest. He said, I'm really glad I didn't kill you. I said, me too, Colonel. <laughs> and I didn't say, but I thought, and if you had stuck your head up when I was on that M16, you wouldn't be here either. But the other thing, Colonel Took carried a little plastic briefcase everywhere he went on this trip. But at that moment, he said, I want to show you something, and he popped it open. And there were eight what looked like schoolboy notebooks, kind of thick, five by seven, and I opened one. And there's this tiny, tiny spidery script he said through the interpreter, these are my diaries of 10 years at war in the South. I came as a lieutenant commanding a company and stepped off the Ho Chi Minh Trail into the battle 
at landing zone x-ray in the Yadrang Valley. And I fought for 10 years, ending as a senior colonel commanding a division in the attack on Saigon. Uh, I was eight times wounded, three times so badly that I ordered my men to abandon me and they disobeyed my orders. Uh, that, that, those diaries to me represent uh, a treasure, something that we ought to be collecting, and translating to see the war from their side even more clearly. He wrote in that diary every day what was going on, what was happening to him, his thoughts his dreams, his hopes. Uh, so now we're in play coup. And uh, ABC, with their deep pockets, uh, had paid 4000 an hour to charter a clapped out old Soviet hind helicopter to lift us into a landing zone x-ray. And uh, we got aboard, it, it would, wouldn't hold us all, so it was two lifts going in, two lifts coming out. And we got aboard and uh, the pilot said, we don't know where this place is. And uh, Hal Moore pulled out his old battle map and uh, he and old snake shit, Bruce Crandall, the aviator, knelt between the two pilots up front and then hollered over their shoulders, anybody got a compass? The civilian had his old Boy Scout compass and dug it out and they shot an azimuth and we flew straight to landing zone x-ray. And we spent an incredible day walking it, talking it, each of us finding his place, his memories. And uh, near the end of the day, we had a security platoon that had come overland, eight, nine mile march from a border post to uh, overwatch as we had our day in the sun. And uh, along about four o'clock, they boogied out of there because they didn't want to walk home in the dark. So they took off and we loaded all of the Vietnamese except one translator and about half of the Americans onto the first lift. And as soon as that chopper lifted off into a clear blue sky, General Moore said, Joe, Tell the boys to take the canteens down to the creek and fill them up and don't forget to put the iodine tabs in. And while they're out there, tell them to drag up a big pile of firewood. And I looked at him, I said, sir. He said, don't ask, just pass the order. Yes, sir. I can do Sergeant Major Plumley. <laughs> and I went over and I passed along the Colonel's instructions and Larry Gwynn looked at me and said, Joe, has the heat got to the old man? I said, don't ask, just carry out orders. So they're off dragging up the wood, filling the water bottles, and a big black cloud appeared in that clear blue sky out of the east, coming our way at a high lope. And uh, I, I thought to myself, Al Moore has arranged this with God. <laughs> He's going to get his night in landing zone x-ray, and we're going to get one too. <laughs> Whether we wanted it or dreamed of it, he did, and he prayed for it, and he got it. So here it comes. The monsoon is upon us. Anybody got a poncho? the civilian. <laughs> it went to cover the pile of wood. And we all stood there like jackasses in a hailstorm and were rained on for about 45 minutes. 
not the first time in that country. And we stood there, and after the rain cleared, it was dead dark, and we knew that helicopter was not coming back. Skies cleared off, and before we lit our pile of wood, we were treated to the most magnificent shower of meteors I have ever seen. I mean, I go, I'm nutty enough to go out among the mosquitoes and watch the Persid meteor showers. We're talking Persid times 10 here, 20, 30, 40 a minute from every direction. Just awestruck and no ambient light whatsoever. So it made that much more spectacular. And I think we all had a sense that all of the men who had died there on both sides were telling us, we're at peace, and so should you be. And so should you be at peace. And we spent that night backs up against little scrub trees, just like I had during the battle, and uh, doze off, wake up, and in the flicker of the light from the fire, I saw Hal Moore walking the perimeter alone most of that night. The foxholes are still there, now eroded just really dimples in the earth with wildflowers growing in the bottom of them. Nature seemed to have done a very good job of healing the scars of war in that place. We spent that night, long about 4 a.m., our security platoon came beating back through the jungle to rescue us. And as soon as it broke day, the helicopter came back, and the first guy off was a visibly agitated uh, General Lon, who had spent that night, he who had tried to kill us all, had spent that night walking the floor of his hotel room, hoping that nothing had happened to us. So this is the heart of the new book, this story of the return and of finding friends in strange places and seeing a country, seeing Vietnam as a country, not a war, and seeing after 33 years that it was time to somehow find peace. And so that's the story. There some other chapters bringing you up to date on the deaths of Rick Rescorla in the World Trade Center, the death, sadly, of Miss Julie Moore four years ago, a chapter of distilling General Moore's leadership principles, which some people have said is worth the price of the book all by itself. I recommend that to you and a chapter on war, which distills the general's and my own combined 75 years of intimate experience of war and warriors and when we should go to war and when we might not go to war and uh, dispelling some of the old myths that military men love war and uh, trying to explain to a civilian audience that if, if an old soldier is the man with the finger on the button, war is the last card he will ever play because he knows the price of it and he knows who pays that price. So that's, that's the book. That's the reason for it. That's what we found. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> and uh, I think we can probably safely go to questions now. Is that good enough? Thank you.
raise your hand and we will get a microphone to you. Come on, y'all aren't going to let me off that easy. I know. Somebody's moved. Here, Here we, we go. go. Oh, hello, sir. Oh, good to meet you. I wanted to ask you if you ever heard of two obscure books now out of print, required reading in military academies in the world. It's called The Devil's Brigade and Return to Inferno. It is uh, supposedly penned by an ex SS German officer who commanded uh, several German brigades in the French Indo-Chinese War. Uh, his pen name is Hans Weisnew. Have you ever heard these? I've heard of the Devil's Brigade. I haven't heard that other title. Returning to Inferno, which is when he returned back as a contract mercenary. Ah. Now, the, there is a question as to the authenticity of these books, whether they are fiction or non-fiction. Uh, I guess it's like 70, 30, 70% 70 say yes, it uh, was true. 30% uh, well, people say it might be just fiction. I just wanted to get your take on it. If you have heard of these books and if you knew the authenticity. I don't know the authenticity. I've heard of the first one. And I may have actually read it, but if so, it was a long time ago. Yes, you can't get the books. I unfortunately have the, the both of them. Uh, I keep them guarded. Wish I could help you with that. Yeah, I, uh, on the internet I surf some in, uh, actually there's some uh, military people in South Africa, they uh, had those books as required readings in their cabinets. Also, did you and uh, Hal Moore know uh, David Hackworth? Sure. Uh, I always respected his opinions and, and enjoyed his articles. Uh, uh, did you guys comment on, on his philosophy? And, uh, well, General Moore was a, a good friend of Dave Hackworth's, and uh, he and Hank Emerson delivered the principal eulogies at Hack's funeral. Uh, so Hack, Hack, uh, General Moore thought, thought quite highly of Hack. Well, was Hack really despised by the uh, military community? Uh, there was, it was black or white. You know, there was no gray with Hackworth. They either liked him or they hated him. Yeah, I read, I read his book about face, and that was fascinating. Uh, yeah, I did too. Uh, and I also watched him operate during the Gulf War and found that his uh, estimation of the situation was about somewhere between 50 and 60 percent right. But boy, when he was wrong, he could really lay the clankers down. Uh, if I may now, you talked about the experience of meeting with General Ahn and the, the bonds that were formed between two soldiers, uh, especially on this uh, follow-up visit when you actually went to the battlefield how did he represent his own exercise of command? Uh, was he willing to acknowledge shortcomings uh, as well as uh, uh, the strengths in his exercise of leadership in battle? Oh, absolutely. You know, because we, 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 we had six, eight hours taped with him and went into these questions, you know, and uh, why didn't you attack our rear? the first afternoon. And uh, he said, well, you can't know everything that's happening on a battlefield, unfortunately. Uh, and he said repeatedly that he was trying to move unit in that direction, but that is precisely where uh, Henry T. Herrick, Lieutenant of Infantry, led his platoon on a wild goose chase after two fleeing enemy and got half of them killed, but landed square by the accident of war, square in the middle 
of the available path that would have led to our rear. And the enemy spent the next 27 hours trying to wipe out the remnants of that platoon led by a three-stripe buck sergeant named Ernie Savage who was closest to the radio and took command when the lieutenant was killed. Uh, two sergeants were killed and two more senior sergeants were killed and, and from the moment that Ernie Savage took over they lost not one more man killed and they fought for 27 hours through a long night, repeated attacks by an overwhelming number of enemy and had so burrowed themselves below the surface of the earth that even if only a few inches and were calling the artillery down so close that they were covered in dirt and branches and they had almost disappeared into the earth, the enemy would attack across them and not even know where they were. And they would shoot them on the way out. Uh, there, there was heroism that night in that place. And uh, General Ahn said of that encounter, he said, I ordered my commander to wipe those men out but their will to live was stronger than our desire to kill them. Uh, and, and he acknowledged other mistakes. I, uh, <clears throat> I had one burning question. I had been in Play Me Special Forces camp with Charlie Beckwith three weeks before this and uh, when they were finally driven off from there I marched out with a CAV battalion and, and we found 12, 14 of those tripod mounted uh, enemy 51 caliber Chinese made anti-aircraft machine guns. They had shot down two Hueys, a Sky Raider and a B-57 Canberra bomber around that camp. And I asked General Lon, I said, you, you didn't deploy any of those heavy machine guns against us in x-ray. Had you done so, you would have shut that landing zone and, and you could have taken the first lift and wiped them out in, in a matter of hours. And he dodged the question. So being a good reporter, I kept asking it until finally he was very exasperated and, and what he said was this. Yes, I had another company of heavy machine guns and they were emplaced around the headquarters of General Mon over on the Cambodian border. Things are the same in both armies. <laughs> Sir, um, I, I speak for at least some here to say thank you for what you chronicled and archived and that we've been able to uh, watch on the screen and read in the books. Thank you. It's important to us. Um, as one who loves to read and also one who loves to watch movies, I always wonder about how much of what we see on the screen is actually what happened. Are you happy with Barry Pepper's performance, his representation of you, and what, how much of the interaction between he and Mel Gibson on the screen, are you happy with what came out in the movie? The, first I'll look at the overall accuracy of the movie. My judgment, 70 to 75% reality based on the book. 20, 25% Hollywood bullshit. But this is the reverse of normal for those guys. <laughs> so, so you got to be happy that they got it that much right. And by the way, I mean, General Moore and I rode that guy's butt for eight years to get that accuracy. And uh, although, what, what I would say is that Randy Wallace 
captured the spirit of it correctly. In some of the details, and you who fought in that place and know infantry tactics, easily spot what was bogus. What you don't spot is the director, who was also the writer, decided that he was going to have Barry Pepper play this fellow Galloway as kind of green. And uh, I had by then had seven or eight months with the Marines in I Corps, and I'd made every operation that they had conducted to include a combat amphibious assault landing, and there ain't many Marines today who've done that. And Sergeant Major Plumley did not have to give me an M16. I brought my own. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, you know, I look at the, the inaccurate parts and, it, and I grind my teeth. Uh, the final bayonet charge up the hill into the face of the heavy machine guns whose gunners never pull the trigger, they just grit their teeth and wait to be hosed down by a formerly slick Huey helicopter that suddenly appears with many guns mounted on it, which did not arrive for another 18 months in Vietnam. Now that pisses me off. Uh, and, and what I argued with uh, Mr. Wallace is that the truth was far more dramatic than his bullshit ending. Uh, just simply so. Because how more did order fix bayonets? And he ordered everybody to move out 100, 150 meters and, and kill the last 50 or so stay behinds and snipers tied up in the trees. And when, he got, when you got to the limit of the advance ordered, there was another order for everyone to turn around, drop to their hands and knees, and crawl back through the tall elephant grass and find the two missing men so that everybody came home. And to me, that was more in keeping with the story, and more dramatic than hosing down a bunch of enemy and splashing one last bucket of blood on the camera lens. Uh, but, you know, when you argued with them, what they tended to say was, this is a theatrical release movie, Joe. This is not a documentary for Discovery Channel. You all have already done that. And that would end the argument but not the distaste. So that's Hollywood. And someone always asks, is the story about your great-grandfather's true? <laughs> and I say, yes, you can't make stuff like that up. Uh, but Hollywood being Hollywood, it was not Galveston, Texas. It was Franklin, Texas. And it wasn't a pair of shoes that they bought every year and split up. It was a pair of boots. For God's sakes, it was Texas. <laughs> I was particularly interested and touched by your assessment of people in uniform on opposite sides being closer to one another, ultimately, than members of their individual society, civilian societies. And I'm wondering if you can expound on your reasoning for that statement a little bit and whether, in your opinion, that is a healthy social situation. Hmm. <laughs> well, I, I don't do social commentary. No. I, just, I just saw what I saw, and I feel what I feel. And... Uh, for a civilian media puke, I, I have, uh, you know, a greater affinity for soldiers than uh, any other civilian media pukes or any civilians at all. Uh, the closer you get to the flagpole, the higher the quality of people, in my humble estimation. 
and uh, I know who I'd rather spend time with. And I think that something of the same thing operates looking at an American general <laughs> finding a bond and things in common with a Vietnamese general, however different their societies may be. Uh, we talked about this, General Moore and I, and talked about a lot of things, but you know, you got 20 some hours on a Trans-Pacific flight, you got to have something to talk about, and that's one of the things that we chewed over. And early on, decided that you really were almost blood brothers. They cared enough about their cause and followed the orders of their society and they were willing to kill and die in a war for their ideals just as we were. And so in a strange kind of sense we really are blood brothers. It's each other's blood, but... Uh, and in a world which really, if you want to get cynical about it, doesn't give a crap how you'll ever die. Someone you fought against who walks the floor worrying about your safety at night out on an old battlefield is maybe you have more in common with him than anybody else. Seemed like to me anyway. I don't know if I've answered that question very well, but that's as good as I'm going to do it. <laughs> Thank you.